Hi everyone. See, we have a good group coming on in tonight for our virtual 3 and 30 gallery program hosted by the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. My name is Izzy Fuqua. I'm the adult programs coordinator. So let's go ahead and get right, get right down to business. We are delighted tonight to host Dr. Leo Mazo, our curator of American art, uh, to discuss a new exhibition that is on view, George Bellows Sport, Leisure and Lithography. Uh, just a little bit of background about the program. This is a monthly uh, gallery talk that's hosted typically in person, but when the museum closed, uh, we did transition to the virtual platform. So I'm delighted that Leo has agreed to uh, deliver this talk virtually tonight. So with that, Leo, I'm going to turn it over to you. Hi, everybody. I'm Leo Mazo, Cochrane Curator of American Art here at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts and I'm going to be speaking today on the topic of George Bellows Sport Leisure Lithography um, which is the name of an exhibition that we currently have on view um, um, for quite some time now till no November. This is in the Works on Paper ga Gallery and uh, all the all of 14 of the 15 works on display are on loan from a private collector named D. Cantor. Uh, and the 15th work um, was very generously given to us by um, D. Cantor uh, a few years ago, just re recently. And so we're so very, very, very great, grateful for this generous loan of artworks making possible this exhibition. Now, a lot of you know who George Bellows is. And if you do, um, let me see why this will not go down. Here we go. Um, you know who George Bellows is. Um, it's a name you would learn in an art history class. It's certainly um, a name you would encounter if you just strolled through the galleries at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. Um, we were recently gifted not one, not two, but five major works, four paintings and a very, very lovely drawing by um, Francis and Jim Mc McLaughlin. Uh, you may know Kids or Summer City or the later and more elegant uh, Tennis at New Newport. You may have also heard that Bellows was, we, we recently had a Hopper exhibition at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts and Edward Hopper and George Bellows, different as they are, they were classmates together under Robert Hen Henry. Um, and where Hopper's career uh, staggered, little starts and stops, and he ends up doing commercial work, Bellows, conversely, is kind of a rock star, just really amazing, uh, amazing success, critical and pop popular. Uh, accomplishments, achievements right out of the gate. And at VMFA, um, I encourage you to have a look in the McLaughlin uh, galleries and in the American, in the American de department there on the second floor, you'll see early works like May Day and Kids and later works like Tennis at New Newport. Bellows is often called an ash can artist, ash can, like trash can, but ash can. In a sense, that's because he leveled the playing field, changing the rules of what counts as art in the first place. Even someone huddled around an ash can in the depths of winter for heat. Uh, in the painting kids, unsupervised kids, horsing around, smoking a cigarette, skinny dipping in a river. Um, um, that's very much the so-called ash can spirit. Other ash can artists would be John Sloan, Everett Shen, uh, George Lukes, William Gla Glackens. Not always, but typically they had sort of, they painted in a very painterly um, style. Um, there, there, there is a line, but they're what you would call very vibrant, pulsating, painterly, 
artists where the accretion of colors is how you model forms. And they often, but not always, have urban uh, subject matter. So this exhibition, however, explores the role of sport and physical culture in the lithographs of Bellows. His life dates are 1882 to 1925. This esteemed early 20th century realist is largely called the, an Ashcan artist on account of his gritty subject matter. A lot of which you see in this ex exhibition, these prints. He's well known for the paintings I just showed you that capture the dynamism and prosaic as opposed to necessarily highbrow po poetic aspects of urban environments with dark palettes and painterly modeling of form. But he's also able to achieve similar uh, effects with the monochromatic, the black and white, the shadow and light um, nature, the monochromatic nature of lith lithography. And, and, and this, is, this is a view uh, which you're looking at here. This is an installation photograph. Our design team and our handling team uh, did, a, did a really good job. I think they did justice to the, to the lithographs them, themselves. In 1916, Bellows installed a lithographic press in his studio, and from then until his untimely death in 1925 from a very acute uh, peritonitis, periton periton a kind of appendicitis, uh, he, in 1925, he created just under 200 lith lithographs. Now, he, this is really a great image. Uh, this isn't one of my three and 30, but it's, it's an important it's an important work. Here we see the cigarette smoking artist with his hand on a lithographic stone. Um, and he self-identifies the, the modeling you see in the frame. You can see this is a mirror frame, um, but he's identifying himself as a printmaker here. He understood that the monochromatic or black and white uh, the two-tone nature of the medium, its striking contrasts of light and shadow made it an effective means through which to explore the strenuous activities and pastimes that he prized. Now, why did he prize these sports? Well, these activities. Well, he himself, George Bellows, was a varsity lettered baseball player at Ohio State University. He was recruited by the Cincinnati Reds, but he opted for a career as a painter and printmaker and illustrator instead. But even in New, New York in the early days, he did play semi-pro ball. Um, but it's not just sports he's interested in. He's really, he's interested in boxers hitting each other in the gut and capturing that type of sensation. But as an artist, he's also interested in what it means to be a spectator in that sport. What does it feel, Bellow seems to ask us, to be in the second or third row within spitting distance of the dramatis personae just beating the heck out of each other here? Um, Bellows, in a work like, like this, he really wants us to, to, to give us the you are there feeling. The strenuous activities of Bellows' bodies in motion are enhanced by the unique aesthetic of lithography that shows the results of the artist's hands at work. This is a stag at Shar Sharkey's. Audiences have long pr prized a stag at Sharkey's as his most fluid, dynamic, and expressive lithograph. Jack Sharkey owned a bar, and in the back of the bar was a a, uh, a site, a rather large, about as big as the bar, uh, an area where he would hold fights, and these would be called stags. Sharkey is himself an ex-prize fighter in New, in New York. With its wide tonal range, this image is about as painterly as a linear print can be. He may have realized this was one of his best works. He made 99 prints of this. His addition size, as in how many prints, how many, um, how many prints, how many uh, versions of each print there are. Uh, the number varies widely, but he made 99 of this, which was much higher than his usual edition. One of um, 
this is one of Bellow's 16 lithographs depicting prize fights. Um, this is not only bold for artistic reasons, but because boxing matches in New York were in fact, were in fact Ill illegal at the, at the time. Um, or they had been legalized when he, this is based on a painting, which you see it right. It was illegal when he painted the work that this is based upon. Um, it had been only legalized a few months before he made this print. Like so many artists, past and pre present, Bellows uh, capitalized on the popularity of his best known works, often by making lithographs of, of them. The sport's growing fan base also helped him sell all of the impressions in his life, lifetime. Bellows crops in the sides in the lithograph version, and he removes the audience me members and back, or a lot of them at any rate, as well as the front rope. So in this way, we're even more uh, a spectator of the, of the um, scene uh, than we are in the, in the print. We're even closer to the interlocking, lunging players, fighters. And now for something quite different. In August of 1919, Bellows visited the Newport Casino in Newport, Rhode Island for an invitational tennis tournament featuring some of the sport's top players. He was um, commissioned to make a few images here, and he was certainly interested in athletics. Uh, here you see people playing dub doubles. But he took equal notice of the lust surroundings and the very posh uh, perhaps rich and famous attend attendees in the audience who often spent their summer vacations along the Rhode Island coast. And as much as he's interested in the game, he's even more interested, I think, in what's happening here in the fore foreground. A man and a woman speaking, other individuals who appear to, I don't know what they're doing, they're stretching, they're uh, moving about, they do not appear to have their attention set on the game. Bellows wants us to know that we are at a tennis match in a building, by the way, built by McKim and White, Charles McKim and Stanford White of the firm McKim, Mead and White. But he also wants us to know that we're a spectator. There. And so he's really interested in giving us that you are there feeling, you are in the audience, what we might call a co-expansive space. And so, he made, over the course of the next year, Bellows made four paintings and two lithographs based on that visit. Though this lithograph doesn't cl as closely relate to the, its source as the uh, previous image does, it does show that elegant facade built by McKim and White. The stylish audiences at Newport Casino are certainly dressed differently than those who patronize the seedy boxing clubs of New York City, but their presence and their comportment, their behavior, seem to have been just as interesting to the artist, perhaps overshadowing, as I was saying, the doubles matches, doubles tennis match. Um, and in tennis, not so different than the tournament, he might um, individualize the spectators more than the play players. The um, so these two works are unlike other works depicting his tennis matches, really because of how he positioned the light sources outside of the canvas, casting long shadows on the Newport Casino at rear. And so a logical question might be, how can the guy who painted those seedy, grimy, sweaty, dimly lit places show these this, you know, lifestyles of the rich and famous, very elegant club in Newport, Rhode, Rhode Island. Well, in that short life, in that short career that Bellows had, I think I might have said Benton, because um, this is not Benton, this is Be Bellows. In the short career that he had, he was no one-trick pony. He was interested in portraiture as much as he was in these genre or everyday scenes. And in fact, in the same years as he's making paintings like the tournament, he's painting quite refined. I mean, there's a market. He has a long list of clients awaiting his uh, portraits. He, paint, he paints a number of well-to-do individuals, dig, dignitaries, and you can see the refinement of form 
uh, this in this not so gritty picture of his wife Emma and their two kids from just a few years after he made the tournament. George Bellows is really interested in sports, but even if he hadn't been, it would have been very diff difficult not to know who Billy Sun Sunday was. The Reverend Billy Sunday initially gained fame as a major league baseball player, starting off with, with the Chicago White Stockings and then traded to the Pittsburgh Al Alleghenies and ultimately to the Philadelphia Phillies. And in his later press as an itinerant, evangelical, wildly popular pre preacher, his press releases and the press that they generated always called attention to his baseball past. Now, beginning around 1915, George Bellows made one painting, three drawings, and two lithographs of this wildly popular itinerant evangelist. And I said a moment ago that Billy Sunday capitalized and has pressed it on his being a baseball player. In all of his, he often had, in the, in the press photography, as you can see, he often, this is Sunday as a preacher at Wright. You can see that he appeared, I don't know why he always tugs his, his, his ear, uh, like he's giving a sign. Um, but similarly, when he would give these, when he would do these large crusades and these makeshift tabernacles, he would often appear like an umpire calling out Satan or sinners or something like that. You can imagine here in this very well-known print by Bellows from 1923, you can imagine him um, like an umpire calling somebody out. So what's the story behind this? Well, let's go to one of the real mega images of the exhibition. In 1915, the New York-based Metropolitan Mag Magazine commissioned the communist, the, the anarchist journalist, John Reed, to go to Philadelphia for the latest tabernacle revival of the by then wildly popular Billy Sunday. Joining John Reed, also on commission from the Metropolitan Magazine, was George Bellows. Now, it made Bellows was a natural source to join John Reed. Do you all know who John, I'm sure you probably do know who John Reed is. If you've seen the movie Reds, you certainly know who John Reed is. Uh, the history of communism in America, you can't get away from John Reed. We, we have the John Reed clubs, in fact. But Bellows in 1911 had started illustrating for the socialist magazine, The Masses, and he um, he was on the editorial board of the masses. He was a natural choice. And so Bellows and John Reed go down and they speak to Billy Sunday's wife, who you see right here. And she at first did not want to let them in. You can see at the very top here, it says Christ for Philadelphia, Philadelphia for Christ. Now, when the, when the Billy Sunday spectacle would go from town to town, um, enormous makeshift wooden tabernacles would be built. As with a traveling circus, there's going to be a lot of sawdust from cut lumber uh, on the ground. And Billy Sunday's line, his promenade of individuals waiting to be saved by the preacher, by, by way of the preacher, uh, was called the sawdust trail. The word horror vacui in Latin means fear of emptiness. And this is, gosh, this, this is a pretty cluttered print. And so for that reason, in the Metropolitan Mag Magazine, Bellows provided a key for it. And you can see, here's the sawdust trail. We, again, we are in the audience. And really it's the audience letting us feeling like we're in the audience. What this has in common with Staggett Sharkey's or a tennis tournament, is that he understands the investment of the spectator. He understands 
that feeling and the experience are on the part of the beholder. So he pays great attention to us looking in here um, into our own vantage point. So here we have the sawdust trail. There you have an usher right there. Uh, there's Billy Sunday himself. There's Mrs. Sunday, who is, if reports are correct, she was a form formidable uh, character to say the least. Um, Jack Road Roadheaver. Roadheaver was the um, was the um, he was the the musical direct director, the choir master. You have Ackley the pianist in there. Um, look up top, it says patent acousticon. What the heck is that? Well, you see this thing here with these little jagged edges? Well, in the initial drawing that he made, you can actually see that above, the acousticon. You know those toy microphones that kids can get that have aluminum or tin in them, and when you speak in them, it reverberates sound much the same way a, lot, a, 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 a lens might refract light. It sends it forward. And so Billy Sunday had a portable, presumably portable folding device that he called an acousticon. And you can see up here it even says patent acousticon. I've looked on the uh, website of the U.S. government patent and trade office and there's no there's no patent for, for that. He spells it kind of funky as well, A-U-C-U-S-T-I-C-O-N. But in much the same way that Billy Sunday in this later print, in this print, is raised high to project his voice, often shown with an open mouth, so too here, the whole point of an acousticon is like the, um, the um, twisted, steel um, metal in a microphone, the whole point of this is to carry the voice and to create large echoes. And I think that's really interesting because the whole point is that Billy Sunday has to be heard, especially by us, the audience. And Bellows makes us know that you know we're an important part of the audience. But I was still kind of interested in that and, and what this has to, why he's so interested in sound and why couldn't I find that? Well, it turns out there is, I don't know if there's a patent for it, but there was a hearing aid in the same years called the Acousticon. And I don't know if Billy Sunday or, or George Bellows for that matter was aware of it, although Bellows did, of all things to note, he does literally on his print, right, patent applied for. Um, but this makes sense. Um, think of all the vernacular metaphors in real religion about getting the word, hearing the voice of, of God. It makes sense that an itinerant uh, pre preacher who um, goes from town to town spreading the go gospel, that he would appropriate a hearing ad or popular language uh, having to do with sound and being loud. Billy Sunday is nothing if not hyperbolic, and he would have put his acousticon, his sound, his amplifier, essentially, to good use. What did Billy, what did George Bellows think about this? Well, George Bellows is not anti-Christianity. I'm not sure he's anti-religion. But here's what he says. I like to paint Billy Sunday not because I like, like him, but because I want the world to know what I do think of him. Do you know, I think that Billy Sunday is the worst thing that ever happened to America. He is death to imagination, to spirituality, to art. And remember, these are the years of World War I, right on the heels of America getting involved in World War I. So, and the whole world, of course, the whole free world is against Germany at this time. And he says... Billy Sunday is Prussianism personified. He's against freedom. He wants a religious autocracy. And you see that, you can see why I like to paint him and his devastating sawdust trail. I want people to understand him. He wants us to be in the audience. You know, modernism 
whatever else this slippery word modernism is about. It's about experience and expression. And Bellows is keenly aware that we as be beholders, we are in the audience, either in a museum looking at these or in the 20 something row of a boxing match or an evan evangelical re revival. So those are my comments. I hope that when you feel comfortable doing so, you will put on your mask, sanitize your hands, and stay six feet apart from your friends and family as you come on into the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts and see um, this uh, fun little exhibition. Thank you, Leo, that was wonderful. Um, I had the pleasure of hearing you this morning too, so I like to be able to hear it twice and get get the sense of what you added on to with this presentation. So we did get a question that came in um, specifically about um, Bellow's 1920 tennis painting. I think that's referring to the one in our collection. Mm -hmm. uh, the commentary is that it seems less realistic and more Rousseau-like, uh, as in post-impressionistic. So, um, and, and that seems that way then compared to his earlier boxer paintings. So was his style evolving at this point? It certainly was. And I can show you a simple search. If you go and do a Google image search under George Bellows portraiture, you will find other, um, um, not just spectral colors like green, but also look at the cast shadows here. He really becomes more and more attention to light to, to light sources, the shadows that they cast. He understands the expressive power here. Rousseau, thinking of his tropical, Le, Le Douanier Rousseau. Um, yeah, I could see that. I think that, I think that Bellows, like many Americans in the years after the Armory Show of 1913 that introduces modern European art to the United States, um, I think that he would have been very attentive to, to post-impressionism and the expressive power of color as it ends in its, in its own right, yeah. And this is, let's make no mistake about it, this is pretty darn different than his uh, 19, at, at VMFA we have the, his May Day, which I believe dates to 1908. We, Summer City, a bunch of kids skinny dipping in, in the East River. This is, this, this is quite a, a distance, but the emphasis in popular culture and then being a spectator to that culture um, does carry over. Yeah. Well, you kind of hinted at this. Um, what did, how did critics re uh, respond to Bellow's work and maybe to the Ashcan School in, in total? You know, um, Bellow's, we have to remember, they, they responded well for the most, the most part. Um, but I would argue that although he's often lumped in with the Ashcan School, we have to remember that Bellows was in fact Robert Henry's student. Um, and the word Ashcan, you know, these artists who call themselves the Ashcan group, they often, well actually they did, I'm sorry, let me go back. They didn't call themselves the Ash, Ashcan group. Um, they, often came under, especially 1905 to about 1909, 1910. They, they garnered a lot of press, but in large part because they were seen, seen as outrageous rebels. But they sold a lot, Henry in particular, followed by Sloan and Shin. A, a number of these artists made a good bit of living, a, a, a good bit of money, made a good living as il illustrators, um, Sloan cert certainly did, Glacken certainly did, um, but the word, they were often called the apostles of ug ugliness. There are other derisive terms, some of which were racially inflected because in the pictorial universe of Bellows and Henry and Sloan, it's not uncommon to see African-American individuals treated with all the, res the respect um, and the lack of anecdote and the sincerity that one might find an Anglo-American painter um, depict, uh, subject depict, depicted. Not everyone was as um, accepting of, of that, certainly. And the word ashcan was originally sort of 
the very first usage of this that I know, and I know this because my mom, who's an English professor, um, it's a PhD in American Lit, pointed this out to me. The very first usage of the word ashcan that I know of uh, in American arts and letters is by the, the uh, poet Hart Crane in his 1920s poem called Cha Chaplinesque. Um, ashcan up until that time had been a derisive term to say the least. But Bellows, not unlike Robert Henry, had a good trade, a cottage, more than a cottage industry of making portraits from individuals whose names you would recognize. So I would argue that Bellows' critical fortunes are at least as good, if not a little bit better than some of his fellow gritty early 20th century urban realists. Great. Um, a question just came in about the Armory show that you mentioned. Um, did Bellows exhibit in that show? And no. Said, oh, no, he didn't. Okay, yeah. great. Um, and then we have time for just one final question. I know we're a little bit over time. Um, did Robert Henry affect the art of Bellows and Hopper? You mentioned um, the Hopper show at the BMFA, so maybe stretch yourself a little bit past the ash can. Um, the commentator says that they seem so unlike. They are quite un unlike. Um, they were also very, um, they were also um, um, Bellows did have a painting in the Armory show, by the way, I just on some notes. You answered so quickly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry about, about that. I'm thinking about that. Um, Bellows, uh, so Hopper and you know, they do seem so unlike, but if you saw Rock, uh, Edward Hopper's self-portrait -port on loan from the Whitney on the wall to the left when you walked in, you would have seen that same kind of dramatic chiaroscuro and uh, rather thick accretion of dark Windsor Newton paints. Um, early in his career, I would say you can really see the ashcan spirit in Hopper's work. Uh, the picture of his childhood bed bedroom and mm -hmm. the self portraits certainly look like that. Um, Hopper does not sell as well his paint. Hopper actually sold a painting in the Armory Show, um, but he doesn't sell a painting for years after that. Hopper does make a good living as an illustrator. Now his illustrations are quite tight, linear. They have localized colors, meaning that one form or color does not bleed or fade into another. But um, in Bellow's illustrations, they absolutely do that. That, in fact, is part of their expressive p power. But, you know, Robert Henry was a very accepting guy. He had an enormous amount of uh, female students at a time when it wasn't always so fashionable to, to do so. Um, Robert Henry, when he felt that realist artists were being excluded from the very official National Academy of Design, he formed a sort of Salon de Refuse, a sort of protest uh, exhibition called the, the Eight at Macbeth Galleries. A lot of people think that the Eight were in fact Ashcan artists, and most of them were, but there were other artists exhibiting in the Eight who don't look a thing like Henry's work, uh, Arthur B. Davies, um, Maurice Prendergast. The point is, Henry was about individualism, and he had a big, you know, Henry was a big Whitman fan, read Whitman vor voraciously, and that litany, uh, that very inclusive sense of what counts as American, uh, he tolerated, and it's utterly conceivable to me that he would encourage Hopper to be the best Hopper he could be, and Bellows to be the best Bellows that he could be. That's great. Um, thank you, Leo, for this wonderful talk. And um, thank you for sharing this exhibition. I'll, I'll echo your thoughts. I hope when people feel safe and comfortable to do so that they can come see it in person. Like Leo said, you have until November to do so. so thank I, you. Oh, yeah. I want to thank you, Izzy, for making this happen. You put this together in rather quick order. I think we first started talking about this a month ago or less. Yeah. We got postponed. So I don't know how you shuffle, you juggle all these things and manage to manage a smooth landing for everything, but you did. And I'm really grateful. Thank you so much for making this so easy for me.
Thank you, Leo, of course. Well, everyone, that's all. So we look forward to connecting you with again soon at another VMFA program virtually. Have a nice night.